Hi, everyone. Welcome to the first lecture of the Global and Intercultural Communication course. Um, today, we'll be talking about some of the foundational theories in the field. And to do that, we're going to be focusing on two big giants of intercultural communication um, that you may have heard about already. Uh, certainly after this course, you'll hear about them a lot. Uh, those uh, figures are Edward T. Hall and Geert Hofstetter. So we'll be using uh, Hall and Hofstetter as kind of proxies. They were really uh, some of the founding giants. They weren't the only ones by any means, um, but we'll using them kind of as proxies to, to think about some of these uh, foundational theories of intercultural communication, which uh, for many of us who have gone through trainings or graduate school, it's kind of part of maybe a little bit of the air we breathe. And we're gonna be examining it a little bit more critically um, in this course. Uh, as we look to more dynamic theories of intercultural communication to use today. So uh, founding giants of intercultural communication, some, some um, notable names on here. Uh, again, not an exhaustive list by any means. Uh, Edward T. Hall, who worked mostly in the 20th century. Uh, Geert Hofstetter, again, worked mostly in the 20th century. Harry Triandis, who we'll be hearing about from this in this course as well. Milton Bennett, uh, familiar to probably some of you as the uh, founder of a developmental model of intercultural sensitivity. Uh, Janet Bennett, um, also a big figure in intercultural communication. And I wanna uh, relate all of these figures, especially the first few, to uh, the 20th century search for a science of culture. This is really important to thinking in a more critical way about the concepts of the foundational concepts because they were part of this larger kind of paradigm and this larger framework of searching for a science of culture. This had been a, a dream since the enlightenment of Western thinkers. And as we think critically about the kind of Westernized approaches to intercultural communication or dominant approaches, important to think about what were, what were some of these thinkers really drawing from as they went about their work and what they were really uh, inspired by um, and really influenced by was natural science, uh, the rise of physics and the importance given to, given to physics. And for anyone who recently saw the movie Oppenheimer, you know, you can get a sense of what kind of importance was attached to the revolutions in science that happened in the 20th century as well as to a psychological, uh, in the psychology uh, areas, um, a movement of behaviorism, which really looked to make psychology into a natural science. These are really important kind of concepts. We're gonna be unpacking them a bit more. You may be at first saying, what is, how is this related to intercultural communication? Um, but because these influences were so broad, they really, impacted how um, these, these thinkers really approach their work. So the search for a science of culture, you can actually see the title of a book by Leslie A. White, who was an anthropologist in the 20th century, titled The Science of Culture, A Study of Man and Civilization. There was um, some colonial aspects to the rise of anthropology as a field in the Western world, in both the United Kingdom and in the United States. Anthropologists were early on very much tied to the overall colonial projects of different countries. And this effort to understand the other, uh, to understand others was very much tied to the need for, for national security. Um, so anthropologists, uh, psychologists, intercultural communication theorists were very inspired by theoretical physics, the rise of theoretical physics. And just as physicists sought to understand and sought the new laws of the universe, anthropologists, psychologists, sociologists, and educators sought to uncover the laws and patterns of culture and society. And what really inspired them was the revolution in physics. Um, primarily, as we'll see, the Einstein's relativity theory. So again, bear with me, but if you think about Einstein's relativity theory as upending the Newtonian kind of static impression of the universe. So the uh, Einstein's relativity theory posited a whole new way of interpreting the relationship of motion and energy and light 
the anthropologists and intercultural communication theorists also applied the same sort of ideas that relativity of cultures like relativity in physics expanded the universe not into a single picture a western picture but into a multiplicity and this was a you know thought to be a revolutionary kind of finding now as they were doing this they were really guided by western thought as we'll see but they imagined it as really kind of broadening out from from western dominant thought here are some popular books um, in the time period. So uh, in the 20th century, uh, Ruth Benedict's Patterns of Culture, uh, Claude Levi-Strauss, The Savage Mind. Um, Levi-Strauss was an anthropologist, a French anthropologist who moved to the United States and was very popular. Um, and this was one of his books, uh, many books. Um, and then uh, one of the figures we're studying today, Edward T. Hall, The Silent Language and various other books. And you can see a little bit through the patterns of culture by Ruth Benedict, by the kind of image in, in the savage mind that this kind of search for laws and patterns and broad culture general approaches was very uh, prominent in the time period. So why do these foundational theories, if they're so, if we're saying they're so kind of outdated, uh, why do they matter? You know, why are we studying them in, in this course if we're saying that they were part of an older regime, an older set of theories? Well, they're used today still. They're still classics, still considered classics and used today throughout pre-departure orientations, trainings, uh, the Peace Corps, NGOs, uh, government programs through the sharing of best practices. So they're still prominent in the field and sometimes examined a little bit uncritically, just sort of picked up from before and carry over and put in new bottles or new buckets. And we're, we're trying to, you know, kind of rethink the approach to the field. They weren't necessarily always research driven or validated. So some of the early theories um, certainly drew upon some research. Edward T. Hall was an anthropologist and by, by academic training, he was drawing from empirical research but they, the research was quite nascent. It wasn't very, um, by today's standards, it wasn't uh, really quite that robust. And so it wasn't always research driven or validated. And then, as I said, it was really inspired by, not by the study of other cultures really, but by natural science paradigms, natural science epistemologies, natural science philosophies that um, really uh, were about the scientific method and that sort of thinking around experimentation, um, as well as early anthropology. So here are some uh, popular images, uh, some models that we tend to use today um, that were inspired and, and driven out of that period. Uh, Edward T. Hall himself, um, later in his career, uh, came up with the iceberg model of culture that many of us may use to teach today. And it's still, you know, there's, I'm not saying that there's not use in it. Um, it there's certainly use in it, uh, but it, it's, it's used quite widely today and sometimes, again, uncritically looking at it. And the iceberg model of culture, as uh, many of you are familiar with, posit is that, uh, that culture sort of sits in two layers. There's the layer above the water, the visible part, the iceberg that's on the tip, that uh, is language, food, dress, folklore, arts. And then there's sort of small C culture. There's all the ideals, the work ethics, the biases, the worldviews, gender roles, which are kind of more unobservable. But as I'll point out, this very kind of image is so visual and text heavy in its design, really westernized in a way. It's very much based on a behavioral way of thinking where there's observed behavior and unobserved behavior. And the observed behavior can help us kind of drill down into the unobserved behavior, but not really recognizing that there might be different kinds of connections between the observed and the unobserved. For instance, uh, folklore, dress, language might be heavily influenced by geopolitics, colonialization, uh, power, American power, uh, by the legacy of empire, by globalization, not by kind of what's driving um, those behaviors uh, by the underneath concepts. 
if that makes sense. It it kind of this this kind these kind of models which attempt to mimic physics in a way, attempt to show kind of displays and models themselves are often kind of in a vacuum. We don't see all of the other historical factors or globalization factors that impact these. Globalization is not even represented on this iceberg model of culture. I mean, that's a huge issue. And then the culture shock graph. So culture shock, kind of a very familiar concept to those in the international education field. And we teach this often or, or counsel students around it. Um, but here too is kind of this attempt to get at a kind of a graphical quantitative model that can be easily represented um, on some kind of scope here. And there's a couple of problems with this. So one problem, the very idea itself did not come from empirical research on students or on individuals. It came actually from Protestant missionaries. And it was an attempt by a researcher to look at Protestant missionaries and think about how they went through a kind of culture shock. So it was on a very, was, the research itself was on a very kind of narrow population. It was drawn from tropes of Christianity um, and the way Christianity was constructed around kind of shock and awe around people who are different from uh, non-Christians. And it was really based on, you know, ideas around the 19th century. So it was not really, has not really been uh, empirically studied and validated in, in any huge respect. And it was really a way to think about a more of a, a physical representation. So there's some problems with our foundational theories, our models that we have, um, that we really need to kind of re-examine today. So we're first, we're gonna take a look at Edward T. Hall. And Edward T. Hall did his early work in the Navajo and Hopi communities. This led to a fascination um, with um, codes and communication, especially nonverbal and indirect communication. He was part of a 1930s and 1940s anthropological milieu that included Columbia University's Franz Boas, uh, Margaret Mead, and Ruth Benedict. And he was really inspired by this uh, theory of linguistic relativity um, by Benjamin Lee Worf, um, who was himself inspired by the theory of relativity in physics. And this was the idea that language determines thought, that language provides kind of an operating system for understanding cultural expression, cues, and values. And this is very similar how in physics and the theory of relativity that was discovered by Einstein, the speed of light determines the relationship between energy and matter. So I, that was Einstein's big discovery, right? And it's a big theory uh, based off of some empirical experimentation, but a theory these thinkers, Edward T. Hall, are trying to get at that kind of macro master theory, and they posited that language determines thought, linguistic relativity. Now, this is a concept, linguistic relativity, that probably many of us would accept as part of our work. Cultural relativ relativity, ethno-relativism, li linguistic relativity. But I, I want to point out maybe some, some dangerous aspects of linguistic relativity or thinking that language itself is the primary determiner of thought as it can perhaps actually rarefy stereotypes, rarefy those, those differences, make those magnitude, those differences further. Uh, Edward T. Hall did his Cold War work for the Foreign Services Institute in the US Department of State and had friendships with uh, the linguist George Traeger, a very famous linguist in the 20th century, and Marshall McLuhan, who is famous communication specialist. Um, you know, you can think back to your college days of like the media is the message, right? So very concerned with the ways that cultures and people communicate. And a lot of his work that where he came up with this series were done in the context of the Cold War and the Foreign Services Institute. And you're going to you read a little bit about this in the course. These were uh, a couple of Edward T. Hall's uh, famous books. Um, and we're going to just read, uh, listen to a little excerpt from the silent language. Um, and I'll play that in a moment. Uh, I can get it working here. <laughs> okay, here we go. Just a short, a few minutes. <laughs> 
The Silent Language, abridged by Edward T. Hall, read by Vincent Bagnon. The Silent Language is a translation, not from one language to another, but from a series of complex nonverbal contexting communications into words. The title summarizes not only the content of the book, but one of the great paradoxes of culture. It isn't just that people talk to each other without the use of words, but that there is an entire universe of behavior that is unexplored, unexamined, and very much taken for granted. It functions outside conscious awareness and in juxtaposition to words. Those of us of European heritage live in a word world, which we think is real, but just because we talk doesn't mean the rest of what we communicate with our behavior is not equally important. While there can be no doubt that language molds thinking in particular subtle ways, mankind must eventually come to grips with the reality of other cultural systems and how life itself is organized. We must also accustom ourselves to the fact that messages on the word level can mean one thing and that sometimes something quite different is being communicated on another level. 30 years is not enough time to make these points. Certainly much more time is needed before all their implications are realized. So hopefully you get a sense of the uh, Hall's approach, uh, his writing style, what he was looking for. He was looking for these kinds of systems, broad patterns, um, drawing a little bit from linguistics, a little bit from anthropology, a little bit from psychology and kind of meshing it together to form his theories um, of the silent language. And again, these were revolutionary ideas. A lot of us would use these right now in our trainings. Um, what I wanna do here is look at the big picture, really, where do these all kind of come from? What are some of the blind spots in them? Um, were they really from actually studying other cultures specifically? Or did they have a lot of influences in Cold War settings and kind of thinking about the relationship between the fight between communism and democracy, um, America and the world? And so there are some significant blind spots there as well. Um, so where were some of Hall's uh, famous uh, foundational theories? We're going to study these in, in more depth, of course, in the course. Uh, but Hall famously pointed out that cultural misunderstandings weren't really, we're about really how different cultural cultures perceive reality, not a failure to communicate rationally. And I want to acknowledge this was a very progressive idea in the 20th century. So there were certainly people and thinkers and forces that were thinking that, you know, cultures were just irrational, right? That certain people uh, were not even worth having a civilized conversation about. I want to acknowledge that for the time, you know, Hall was quite progressive in that sense. And so his point was really that these are different. This is a this is kind of clashes of worldviews or communication challenges around different ways of perceiving reality, including time and space, not failures to communicate rationally. And he was very much um, with other anthropologists at the time and advocating that point, of, that more progressive point of view. So uh, Hall's foundational theories, um, high context versus low context cultures, that's the one that probably many of you are already familiar with. Um, collectivism and individualism, uh, how cultures view time differently. This was um, uh, later termed by others chronemics to mimic proxemics, another of Hall's theories. And so later thinkers called this chronemics, which was the, how uh, cultures approach the understanding of time. So um, this was typically divided into what Hall called polychronic and monochronic. Um, so polychronic being in those cultural situations, those cultures, those societies in which time is thought is very fluid. There's multiple um, events, multiple things going on, maybe even multiple calendars. And um, the approach to time is very fluid. You don't have to show up when the time says you should. It's more about the enjoyment. It's more about the relationships. And this polychronic approach was more associated with collectivist cultures and with high context cultures. Whereas in monochronic time, which was typically in Western uh, cultures like the, in the United States, time is viewed very in a linear fashion. There's always designated, there's an agenda, there's a time to show up, 
you have to be on time. Time is quantified, it's commodified. And that was associated often with individualist cultures and low, low context cultural situations. Those were some of the key ideas. Hall also uh, was very famous for his study of proxemics or how cultures uh, view time and space. And still today, and actually many architecture programs or urban design programs, proxemics is used as ideas for designing spaces around cultural differences. Um, and so it's thought of and actually really well applied today in terms of thinking about how uh, trains should be constructed so that women in certain societies where there might be gender disparities or power differences, they have a space to sit or stand alone and not be too close to a male where that may be perceived to be a problem or a threat to them. So it's used very, very well um, in terms of urban design um, and very, you know, still widely researched today about how cultures view time and space. He was also concerned with uh, relationships between language and thought um, and nonverbal and symbolic systems. We're going to go into more depth uh, um, into the course into this, so I won't go too much more into it right now. Now, collectivism and individualism uh, were not is not a theory that's specific to either Hall or Hofstadter. Uh, both of them drew upon this idea of the dichotomy or or difference between collectivist societies that tend to view uh, social harmony as the primary good versus individualist societies that tend to focus on the individual and the individual's um, human rights or or their uh, their good as the most important. This was kind of just in the air in the 20th century. And as we'll see, uh, Harry Triandis did really the landmark scholarly work on the idea of collectivism and individualism. He added some layers and nuances to the approach. And so you see here that the sort of classic dichotomy between collectivism and individualism where collectivism is associated with Asian, some Middle Eastern and Latin American cultures individualism with Western European, British, and American cultures, and the difference um, in how those, those two are defined. But Harry Triandis really added some additional layers. He added things like vertical versus horizontal orientations and other layers and other dimensions to really get it more nuanced and not sort of put things too much you know, into a box. Geert Hofstetter uh, did not directly build off of Hall's theories but he was clearly influenced them. He didn't, they didn't really cite each other that much, um, but they were clearly aware of each other. Geert Hofstetter did his PhD work in social psychology at the University of Groningen. And then uh, he worked for IBM International in the 1970s and was really at the vanguard of building up the kind of expat international business thinking in the 1970s that became very popular. So he built up the personnel division, the global personnel division for IBM International, and that really solidified his interest in cross-cultural psychology. So he's built a whole brand. Um, his, his family is, is invested in this brand, is part of the brand. Um, you know, the brand is definitely something that he promotes widely or he promoted widely. Um, and it's a whole brand of comparative psychology uh, the Hofstetter Insights website calls uh, Geert Hofstetter the founder of comparative intercultural research. Uh, he's been widely influential in business. And so if you work with your business school colleagues or you're in a business school, most cultural agility programs that are in business programs now are kind of either primarily or loosely based off of his ideas. And he's famous for his Hofstetter cultural dimensions, which we'll go through in a minute. His books were Culture's Consequences and Culture and Organizations, Software of the Mind. So these were his uh, Hofstetter six national cultural dimensions. They're available on the brand's kind of website. You can actually look at all the definitions very much in depth and look at different countries and how that they scale based off of the research that Hofstetter and his team have conducted on where certain countries sit. And there, you know, there are descriptions that add some nuance and updates and you know, variation to his general dimension scores. Uh, these dimensions are power distance. I'm not gonna go through all the definitions of what these mean, but power distance, individualism and collectivism, masculinity versus femininity, which is a controversial one. 
uh, but it roughly relates to how much a culture might value masculine ideals versus classical sort of feminine ideals. Again, this is very uh, controversial. Um, uncertainty avoidance, long-term orientation, um, and indulgence. And so um, part of what Hofstadter was able to do with this, these series of six dimensions was move a little bit beyond some of the classical dichotomies between low context and high context or individualism and collectivism. He was able to kind of say, well, certain cultures might score really high on one dimension and really low on another dimension. And that makes, you know, interacting with people in those cultures um, not as simple as we might assume. And, you know, really thinking about how these things all kind of correlate together. So again, why do these foundational theories matter? Uh, we're going to go through some critiques of them, but they're still kind of in the air today. And the, the goal here in the course is really to say, what can we take from these foundational theories, if anything? Like, do they need, should we throw them out entirely? Um, just given when they were created, how they were created, what paradigms they were created under. So my goal here is to, to sort of just poke poke at this a little bit and say, you know, we need to be a little bit more critical in how we approach uh, these topics. So here are some of the critiques. These are not my, not all my own. These are other, other scholars, other researchers, other practitioners. Uh, we're gonna go in much more depth uh, too into um, the critiques themselves as well as the theories, um, but here are kind of the big ones. So obviously the big, critique would be that they are quite, they were quite binary in their orientation, which itself might be kind of westernized in its approach to knowledge, but they were really rooted in Cold War systems theory. So Cold War systems theory was, was very much a kind of overarching paradigm looking at kind of dichotomies between East and West and communism and individualism. And so a lot of the theories uh, have that binary orientation of, you know, one versus another. And they weren't really thinking that much about the spectrum or the variation or the nuances. Um, most of the research was conducted by Americans on the quote unquote other, sometimes without their permission, without their consent, without their knowledge. Uh, and so that obviously is problematic. Uh, tends to treat culture and cultures as monolithic. So it drew upon older paradigms that were looking at big civilizations and countries as these blocks that could be understood in a very monolithic way. And for various different reasons, including the multiplicity of identities today and the movement and travel and globalization, it's really not possible to think of a culture or a country as one monolithic thought pattern as, as it was before. Um, it was almost solely focused on behavior, competence, and communication, narrowly defined by Western standards. And so, as I'll talk about in a future lecture, behaviorism was a paradigm that made it very important to study outward displays of behavior as a way of thinking about intercultural communication itself. And focusing solely on the ability to communicate, I think, ignores other ways of understanding and communicating or understanding. So solely focusing on your ability, your competence to communicate with someone can really undermine a broader sense of affinity or relationship building. But there's been so much emphasis in the American orientation, the Western orientation, intercultural communication on simply adapting. So it's almost focused hyper on the individual themselves and the individual adapting to another culture and what are the tools and competencies and that they need to adapt. That's been the main focus as Americans are more mobile, as Americans sort of in many ways dominate the mobile study abroad and international mobility space. That was kind of the focus on helping them to understand others by equipping them with communication tools to understand, you know, to take your shoes off in a different culture or to be respectful or to communicate or to bridge, bridge those divides. 
But this is a pretty superficial understanding of what communication could mean uh, if you think about it from a lot of different levels and orientations. It didn't account for individual differences, um, modern, you know, contemporary thinking around diversity, equity, inclusion, decolonization, intersectionality, power dynamics, colonialism, structural racism, all of the things that we're really concerned about and now and can really help reshape our approach to global and intercultural communication. Um, and it can really uh, rarefy stereotypes and differences. So thank you so much. Um, we're going to go into more depth um, into these ideas. Thanks.